Yeah, hi everyone. Nice to meet you again. Uh, this is me and Yolanda. And in next slide, um, our agenda today is first starts with introductions, which is thank you, um, thank you for putting your names, your countries in the chat. And Yolanda will have a um, small recap of what is uh, HIT is. We call it HIT, but it stands for Higher Education Engagement and Transformation Community of Practice, kind of online uh, platform. We are all meeting together, learning. Then we will have quick poll uh, and you will try Padlet. It's also interesting website where you can have some fun putting your answers to our questions. Uh, and we have exciting event today, uh, which is uh, called Donors and Implementers Cafe. Actually, uh, not only implementers, we have everyone here from academia, research, development, use, and we will listen to our great uh, distinguished speakers. Thanks so much for them for coming today. Uh, it's speakers from USAID, IREX, and FHI 360, uh, key organizations in development, as everyone knows. And we will have small Q&A in the end, and we'll tell about next steps. Please, next slide. Thank you, Albina. So um, as a um, recall of what we know, but may, may not know, um, this community of practice is really about engaging the international education community to advance higher education and youth learning priority. It's building that bridge between universities, higher education institutions, and youth, youth organizations, youth NGOs, organizations that work with uh, older um, youth. They go all the way to age uh, 35, but the idea is to really help integrate what we know about positive youth development, making sure that we know what youth um, need and, what, and how they behave so we can really serve them better. So this is what this community is about. Uh, this community of practice is really to strengthen that, that link between positive youth development and all the programming that takes place with um, in higher education. Knowing that higher education is not just universities, but also um, all kinds of institutions that provide higher education services. Thank you. So there's the, the group link that you saw. Uh, we we, we uh, post um, we post ideas and, and references and, and, and suggestions on these group links. You never go to it. Please do. Please do when you can. We would love it and we'll respond as soon as you, uh, you post something. So. Thank you, Albina. Thank you, Yolanda. Yeah, yeah, please use the opportunity of this platform because uh, today, now we will go to this Padlet link. It's in a chat uh, and we will share it here as well. Uh, so what we will have here before the event, as Yolanda said, we, we had this crazy idea to link people from development, donor organizations, and people who, um, who like my friend, who suggested this idea, he's from Kazakhstan as well. He's a young um, researcher. Uh, and he said, I don't understand your jargons. Uh, what USA does, for example, uh, his think tank wants to get some funding, for example, or he wants to get a job, so many questions. and." You don't have simple access to anyone in Washington, for example, just, just to come and ask. So we said, why don't we give you this opportunity to meet and greet people who already kind of working so many uh, years in this field sector, who, who can share with you at least um, kind of introduction information to give you some guidance about what they do in their work, how they do it, what kind of opportunities out there for the youth and for people who, who do not, who have never met with development sector to access it. So we tried to get questions beforehand. You can see some of them here. And now you have opportunity to put your questions in this Padlet link. It's uh, anonymous, uh, it's free and kind of accessible. So this is general questions people asked us, our members. And uh, we hoped that these questions today will help to guide our presentation, our speaker's presentations, FAQ times you will have after each speaker. 
Uh, we know we don't have much time today. Yeah, it's impossible to cover everything. And uh, it's not maybe right place to ask detailed funding questions, but it's a place to learn, to um, kind of get information about what's happening in, uh, in this field. For example, uh, what would you like to know about accessing grants? Uh, what challenges maybe you have already faced when you applied for these organizations? Who knows? Because we want to know our audience better today. Who came to this event? What kind of issues, challenges you guys have? So please use this opportunity, ask your questions. And what you would like to know about funding for youth programs for in our speakers organizations or maybe other organizations they can advise to go and check. Uh, what do you know about getting a job uh, with USAID, FHI and IREX? And what do you know about funding mechanisms? For example, USAID uses. So we can see here maybe some myth some as uh, how to say um, ideas people already heard somewhere and you can just confirm them today check so like fact checking opportunity and learning opportunity so please do put your questions here and i think it, it's also useful for our, our speakers so they will know their audience they are people who are applying for their grants they are partners especially from developing uh, context developing countries who don't have opportunity to go to the office and you know maybe too shy sometimes too timid so people are asking for example i work in a small education ngo in uganda and i'm always looking for help to buy school supplies i don't have connection with <laughs> fhi 360 or irex what should i do interesting what small grant opportunities are available uh, also, we had some interesting question about accessing applications in other languages than English. So not all um, implementers maybe uh, don't have uh, knowledge of English language, but they want to apply for small grants or for partnership. So I think it's also interesting to make your uh, information accessible for everyone globally, because we are working living in a globalized world. So it should be inclusive. Uh, also, people asking um, interesting questions. Do you need to know someone in this organization to get a job there? <laughs> a very uh, straightforward question. Though so people are putting questions, I think everyone can see them, speakers. Also, um, and please don't worry, put your other questions in the chat while you're listening to presentations. And afterwards, we plan to put all questions which are not answered today because of time, or maybe people don't know how to answer them, it's okay. Um, we will put on a hit page and let's start conversations there. So people who know answers, they can comment on our page, uh, community page, so we can keep ball rolling. So don't worry, you will be heard and you'll get your answer. Okay, we have time. Mm -hmm. Yolanda, what do you think? Am I missing something? I think Great. we should get going with our presenters and questions will keep coming in. How's Great. that? All right. So um, I will start uh, with uh, the introduction of Matthew Johnson and Rachel Chilton. We're really honored to have USAID representation uh, with us today. Matthew is the Director of um, Communications in the Office of Acquisition and Assistance. And for those of you who don't really know USA, OAA is like the, the, it's the bunker. It's where everything happens. Without OAA, nothing, nothing would take place. Uh, if ideas would not take shape, programs would not get funded. So it is the most important uh, office we have at USAID. Rachel uh, Chilton is the Deputy Industry Liaison and Deputy Director of Communications at USID. And we're just so honored to have you, Matthew and Rachel. And what we'd like you to focus on both uh, Matthew and Rachel is tell us how does USID work? What does USID do? How can partners 
especially youth organizations and higher education institutions, how can they work with USAID? What kind of funding mechanisms um, exist, especially for youth programming and higher education programming? And anything else you can think of, um, of telling us, it will be helpful. So thank you again, and uh, please take it on. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you for, for having us here today. We're, we're really excited to, to be here to speak with you about USAID, um, as well as our acquisition and assistance processes. Again, um, Matthew Johnson and myself, we are in the Office of Acquisition and Assistance and work on the communications team. Um, and if we can't get through all of your questions today, we will be sharing ways you can stay in touch and, and contact us at the, um, at the end of this presentation. Um, so I just want to kick it off really quickly with a little bit about USAID, um, our mission, our work, uh, our team, and our operational framework, and then I'll kick it over to Matt um, to talk a little bit more about our, our funding processes and how that works. Um, so USAID, like many agencies and organizations, has its own unique history, culture, and way of doing business. This is really important information to understand as you think about becoming a partner of USAID. The agency carries out US foreign policy by working to improve the lives and well-being of people around the world. And although our work is separate from political and military assistance, um, USAID programs address security objectives in addition to our, our development objectives. So that's something to keep in mind. A little bit about our work. Um, the United States is the world's largest donor of foreign assistance, which I'm sure many of you are aware of. Um, we work to improve the lives of, of millions of vulnerable women, children, and men in a variety of ways, uh, such as investing in agriculture, agricultural productivity so that families don't go hungry, combating maternal and child mortality and diseases like HIV, malaria, tuberculosis, and most recently COVID-19. Um, providing life-saving assistance in the wake of disaster. We have a um, Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance that works on this. So most recently, an, an example would be the earthquake in Haiti. Um, promoting democracy, human rights, and good governance around the world. Fostering private sector development and sustainable economic growth. Um, helping communities to adapt to a changing environment, especially with uh, most recently, well, ongoing climate change, climate adaptation. Um, elevating the role of women and girls in, in all of our work and so much more. So that's just like a super small, quick snapshot of, of some of our work. Um, a little bit about our team. Our global team works in more than 100 countries around the world. Uh, we have offices overseas called missions, which are typically co-located with U.S. embassies um, in the capital and in each country um, that we work. We also have a number of regional missions that serve to implement specific regional programs. So an example might be um, our regional development mission in Asia, which is located in Thailand, or our East Africa regional mission in, in Kenya. Um, so those are just a few examples of our, our regional missions. Um, and depending on the sector of the work and if it's relevant, we do work closely with our State Department colleagues at POST as well as our counterparts from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, also known as the CDC, and the Department of Defense, which is also known as the, the DOD. Uh, we are organized in three major staff categories. So we have around 9,000 staff, um, and that includes foreign service officers who are US citizens that work in US embassies worldwide. And they usually are there for two to four year assignments before rotating to a new one. Um, civil service employees like Matthew and myself, uh, we are US citizens who work for the federal government in DC and throughout the US. Um, and then we also have foreign service nationals who work at our USAID um, offices or missions around the world. And they are native to the respective country in which they work. And they're really the backbone of our work. Um, they know the country context, if it's their home, and we, we really couldn't do our work without them. And I'll just talk a little bit about our operating framework um, before I hand it over to Matt. So at the heart of our work is the core belief that each country must lead its own development journey. 
Our vision is to empower grassroots efforts in local communities, and we are making progress towards that by realigning how we, we work and partner so that we better support our partners. This means this really means enabling a country's capacity to plan, finance, and implement solutions to local development challenges, um, and a commitment to see these through effectively, inclusively, and with accountability. So USAID is very strategic in the type of activities and programs that we implement. We have a tool that's called the, the program cycle that looks at how we link everything we do from policies to strategic planning, to program design, to implementation, um, then to monitoring and valuation, and then you know how we incorporate all of those lessons learned back into our policies. In addition, we have a, a number of different policies, strategies, frameworks, visions. I know it's a, a lot of information to take in um, that, that guide how we, we do our work. So an example might be our global water strategy that outlines how we implement our water programs around the world. Um, we also have gender policies that outline how we try to incorporate gender into each program and activity we do. Um, and then in addition to some of the, the policies that come out of Washington, uh, each mission at USAID also has what's called a country development cooperation strategy. So these are known as the, the CDCS. Um, and these govern USAID's work locally in that particular country. Um, I don't know if Matt can maybe drop a link in. We have a, a page with um, all the different CDCSs for each country. So these uh, typically are, are five-year strategies that outline the different goals um, and specific technical areas in, in each mission around the world. Um, we also have an automated directive system, better known as the ADS, and this is our overall arching agency operational policies and procedures. And as you'll learn when it's Matt's turn to speak really soon, um, when responding to a, a proposal or request for application, um, you know, familiarizing yourself with all of these documents and, and taking these into account when you're, you're planning um, your response will really help increase the likelihood of, of receiving funding from USAID. So that's just a little quick snapshot about our mission, our work, our team, and our operating framework. And with that, I will hand it over to Matt. Thanks, Rachel. Um, thanks so much, everyone, for letting us join you today. Um, just to talk a little bit about USAID. We wanted to, I guess, start off with giving you just like a little bit of background about who USAID is and some of the things we talked about, like the country development cooperation strategies, the ADS. These are like acronyms that you'll see USAID using all the time. And really, oftentimes, these are like the documents and resources that the agency is kind of pointing back to that really help to kind of like govern and really decide what we do for specific funding opportunities. So we thought it was important to really highlight some of those. Um, one of the things that I do want to talk a little bit about is kind of how USAID gets its funding and how, how our funding works. And so all of USAID's funding comes from the American taxpayer dollars. And so with that, we are accountable to the American taxpayers. And a lot of the, the rules and regulations and things that we follow are oftentimes, you know, set by our U.S. Congress, set by the President of the United States. Uh, and so, you know, we were talking a little bit before this. One of the challenges we have is, you know, all of the U.S. rules, U.S. government rules and regulations, even the terms and acronyms that we have to use um, don't necessarily always translate to everywhere we work overseas, um, but it's sort of like how the U.S. government is structured and work. And so um, really, you know, it's in kind of important to know that that, you know, our funding comes from the American taxpayers. And importantly, you know, our budget is set by our Congress and executive office every year. And so we get an annual budget that determines uh, how much funding we as an organization have that then it in, ends up translating how much funding we have to do programs and activities overseas. We also get priorities from both our Congress as well as our executive office that often kind of govern and dictate what kind of programs we do, how we do them and where we do them. And so uh, oftentimes, you know, our hands are a little bit constrained. We, we see a lot of amazing ideas that come into us but oftentimes, you know, to be honest, our hands are a little bit tied with what we can do just because of some of the uh, levels that have been set by our funding, as well as program uh, policies that our administration set for USAID. But really one of the most important documents um, that Rachel highlighted is this country development cooperation strategy or our mission strategies. 
And it really tries to take all of these different priorities, looking at what we anticipate our funding levels to be, and really puts them down on paper of here's the types of programs and activities that USAID is looking to do in a particular country or area. Uh, and with that, you know, out of those uh, strategies come out specific funding opportunities that organizations would be eligible or interested in applying for, and organizations compete for those fundings. And so it's important to note that you know, within, like Rachel said, we are very strategic in what we do. And oftentimes we have sort of a three to five year framework of the types of programs and activities that we're looking to implement in a country. And I always tell you, if you're, you're new to USAID, I encourage you to look at a, a country development cooperation strategy for a specific country or region that you're interested in working in, and see how the work that you're doing aligns with that strategy. What we're oftentimes looking for is trying to find organizations that their work aligns with the strategy that we're doing in country. And if we can find a way of kind of meshing those together, it really is something that we're looking for with those kind of with, with partners. Um, but I want to just very briefly um, kind of run through, you know, how do you find funding opportunities? What do they look like? How is that done? And even talk a little about some of the terms. Um, I want to start off. So we have a great video called Acronym Soup. If Rachel can drop it into the chat box that talks about some of the acronyms, some of the terms that you need to know to be able to do business with USAID. There are a lot. I've been with the agency for 14 years and I feel like every week I'm still learning a new acronym that I've never heard of before. Uh, and so, you know, being totally new to the agency or from the outside, I can only imagine the difficulty. So we put together a short video called Acronym Soup that really starts to show you, talk about some of the acronyms, what do they mean and how do they all tie together. But at the end of the day, USAID, like I said, is required to compete all of our funding. So all the funding that we have, we're asking organizations to submit proposals, concept notes, or applications to us and we review and review those applications or proposals uh, to, to see what what ones kind of most closely align with the work that we're doing which proposals we think are you know the most feasible in our work we use two websites that we highlight all of our funding opportunities sam.gov which is where we post all of our contracts i think just given the makeup of this group i'm guessing you're probably not interested in contracts these are mostly like for-profit companies that are interested in applying for contracts with usaid uh, but we issue those through things called requests for proposals where we invite organizations to submit proposals to specific programs or activities that usaid is interested in doing the second website which i think will be most relevant to you is a website called grants.gov and that's where we post all of our grant opportunities as well as something we call a cooperative agreement. A cooperative agreement somewhere kind of between a mix between a contract and a grant, where USAID has some goals and objectives that we're trying to achieve and we wanna have some involvement in it, but we really want you to kind of take the lead in, in implementing that activity or running that activity. But if you go to, to grants.gov, you can see all of the current funding opportunities that are available um, with USAID. And maybe if Rachel can actually drop in the chat box as well, we have a short video of how to even go to grants.gov and kind of navigate to find specific funding opportunities. But really, these are the two places where all of USAID's funding opportunities are posted. Uh, there's no like secret database or some secret place or uh, some organizations know that funding is available. This is where we are legally required to post. And this is actually where all US government funding opportunities are posted. Uh, and so I encourage you to take a look at those websites, kind of become familiar with them. You know, specifically grants.gov, you can actually set up a profile on grants.gov and you can follow um, specific funding opportunities, subscribe to them, get updates and things that are happening. But um, on grants.gov is really, really find all of the things you need to know about specific funding opportunities. Um, for organizations that are new to USAID, I do want to highlight, you know, a couple of different types of mechanisms or specific things that I think you'd be interested in, in focusing in on. Um, I know that there was uh, one of the questions that came in, what sort of mechanisms you know, fit best for our organization? If I was a new organization, I would look at something called, we have these things called annual program statements. Annual program statements, we actually have one um, with uh, related to youth programs and activities that are kind of outline some higher level goals and objectives that USAID is trying to achieve. There aren't any specific funding opportunities associated with an APS or annual program statement. But what happens is our, our missions or offices overseas develop things called rounds or addendums, which are very specific funding opportunities where we invite organizations to submit concept notes to USAID. And so what you're looking for on grants.gov would be an addendum or round to an annual program statement. These are oftentimes some of the easiest and kind of best, best ways for organizations that are new to USAID to kind of get into the mix of things. And this partially because 
Uh, we have an initiative called the New Partnerships Initiative, where we're looking at trying to simplify the way that organizations can kind of access USAID. We have a, a web page on, a page on our website, uh, MPI, New, or the New Partnerships Initiative funding opportunities that actually highlight some of these specific funding opportunities. We also have a newsletter that we'll I'll highlight shortly. But these are really great ways to kind of enter into the agency. What we require up front are just short and simple three to five page concept notes where we really outline what is the overall concept or idea that you're trying to achieve and how that kind of connects to the agency or to USAID's goals and objectives. So I would definitely encourage you to take a look at those. And we can happy to talk a little bit more about the new partnerships initiative in a bit. Well, one of the other tools I think is really important for you is something called uh, USAID's business forecast. So we have a, a business forecast that actually highlights before any funding opportunity is posted on grants.gov or sam.gov, we actually have a business forecast that highlights what are the upcoming projects or activities that USAID is planning on doing in the next uh, couple of months, all the way up to the next year, year and a half. Uh, it's really an important tool um, for you as organizations to think about what are some of the things that the agency is doing, what USAID is doing to be maybe identifying specific program funding opportunities or uh, activities that are out there that you would maybe be interested in partnering in, partnering with USAID in. Um, you'll see here just a snapshot of a media fund activity in Serbia. Um, this is just a, you know, a short overview of um, you know, what we would show you on, a bit on our business forecast, it has a short description of it. When we anticipate releasing a solicitation, um, whether or not it's going to be a contract, grant, or cooperative agreement. We even give you a point of contact if you're interested in following up to get more information. But I would definitely encourage you to take a look at the business forecast. Um, and like I said, happy to chat a little bit more about that as well. Um, but one of the, the questions that we do get asked on a fairly regular basis, you know, what is it required? Do you have to be registered to work with USAID? So there is no specific USAID registration re system or requirement. However, there is a US government wide registration system or process that you have to follow. So the first is you have to have a DUNS number, DUNS and Bradstreet number. Then you have to get a CAGE or NCAGE number, depending if you're in the US, a US based organization, you have to have a CAGE number. If you're overseas, you have to get an NCAGE number. And then the final system is uh, SAM or the system for award management. You have to be registered in these three systems in order to get funding from USAID. Now, if you're looking at a specific funding opportunity or uh, applying for uh, a new partnerships initiative funding opportunity, um, we would encourage you to kind of start the registration process then. You don't have to be registered in all these systems before you apply for funding, but if you do get funding from USAID, we'd ask you to be applied in these systems. I will say that these systems are a little bit complex. They're not the easiest ones to, to navigate through. Uh, but we do have a, a helpful guide um, on kind of uh, registering. We have a, a short video called Registration Expectation. Gives you kind of a helpful guide and tips if you're looking at, if you're new to USAID or new to the US government and registration systems, you can check that out. Um, so, and our team is also happy to help answer questions about the registration system if you get to a point where you're looking to register um, in these systems. So just to be clear, this is the only registration system that is required to, to get funding from USAID. Um, one of the things that I'm most excited to talk to you about is uh, a new website that we're hoping to be launched in the next couple of weeks. It's called workwithusaid.org. Uh, it's a really exciting platform that's going to be set up to really target folks like you and connect you both to the agency, to other organizations, to resources, and really kind of like help you on your journey of partnering and working with USAID. Um, so we a couple of things that we're really excited about with this website. Um, first of all, we have a, a partner directory or directory of organizations. One of the things that we know, there's a lot of amazing organizations out there. We don't necessarily know who all of them are. And so we want to find a way of identifying some of the groups that are out there that are doing development work that USAID can potentially partner with. But we also want to find ways of connecting organizations that are new to USAID or new to the development space to some of our more traditional partners. And so we're setting up a partner directory that allows you to research um, specific sectors, regions of the countries, or different places or areas that you can actually um, connect with other organizations that are maybe doing similar work. I know one of the, the questions that we get all the time is, you know, how do I find other organizations that are working with USAID? Ultimately, this partner directory will be the place that you can go to do that. Um, we will open up, hopefully, the partner directory for organizations to begin um, uh, showcasing themselves in the near future. Well, one of the other things we have on the website is this pre-engagement assessment. I know one of the questions we get all the time is, you know, is my organization even in a position to be able to work with USAID? 
it's kind of a hard question for us to answer without having an in-depth conversation with you. Um, but we've set up this kind of short, it's I think 49 questions, pre-engagement assessment. It's a self-guided uh, assessment that really helps you identify, you know, what is your readiness to be able to actually apply for USAID funding? Depending on what you what the readiness score comes out is, we also have trainings and resources that are actually available to help you kind of be in a better position or be ready to, to work with USAID. Uh, we have a great library of resources, the things that have been created both by USAID and other organizations um, that really kind of help talk through what does the funding process look like. Uh, we also have a great news and insights blog that really talks about what are some of the pathways to partnership where we try and highlight specific funding opportunities or programs um, that are out there. Um, so we're really excited about this uh, particular platform. Um, we have a, a new partnerships initiative um, email address uh, or email newsletter that once we get the website ready to launch, we will be happy to, to share it with you all. Um, before I turn it over to Rachel, um, real quick to talk uh, a little bit about some of the ways to connect with us. I do want to highlight just a couple of other um, smaller grant programs that I think you would maybe be interested in. Um, I saw one of the questions uh, that came in the chat box was about, you know, a startup program. You've got an idea or concept, um, you know, is there funding for you for these types of programs? One of the, my favorite programs at USAID is a program called the Development Innovation Ventures or the DIV program. You just go to usaid.gov slash div, you can learn more about it. But the, the div program we're looking for, what are some really like creative or innovative ideas? And we actually have, I think, three levels of funding within the div program. We help bring organizations or ideas up to scale that can kind of multiply their work. It's a great program um, that I, I do want to highlight to you um, kind of before we turn over. It's something I, would, I definitely encourage you to take a look at. And I know there are some other colleagues from our, our education office and youth office that are on here that I know could highlight some other specific funding opportunities. But I wanna turn it over to Rachel real quick, just to talk about some of the ways to get connected to our team. Um, and I do wanna say, just before I stop talking, turn it over to Rachel, we are, our door is open. We wanna to talk to you. Um, Rachel and I and our colleague Vivian, who's on the, the webinar as well, are like the industry liaison team and part of our role at USAID is really to meet with organizations that are new, help answer the question, help answer the questions that you have. Uh, and so we would love to hear from you um, after this webinar. So with that, I'll turn it over to um, Rachel to chat about um, some of the ways to stay connected. Sure, thank you so much, uh, Matt. I know that that was a lot of information for everyone and it was very quick and I think we're already maybe at our, our time limit. Um, but I just really quickly want to talk about a few ways you can stay connected with us. Um, I dropped in uh, our email. If you want to connect with us at all or have questions, you're welcome to email us at industryliaison at usaid.gov. Um, if you want to be added to our, our ANA, our acquisition and assistance updates email distribution list, you can also email us at industryliaison at usaid.gov and we'll add you there. Um, really quickly, we also have a, a Twitter account called Work with USAID. If you would like to follow along, you're you're welcome to. Um, we also have a Work with USAID LinkedIn group. Um, you're welcome to request to join on our our Twitter and LinkedIn group. We use both of those spaces to um, highlight USAID funding opportunities that that are already available and posted on Grants.gov and SAM.gov. Um, just to, to re-highlight and amplify them for people, as well as other partner tips and resources that might be useful for you, um, in addition to announcing any kind of events we might be having, whether it's our, our business forecast webinar, um, we have a Mondays with Matt Twitter chat, which will be coming up, I believe, on September 13th, um, where you can also submit live questions to that Twitter chat. And then finally, um, for the website, Matt just talked about, I believe the link is working. Let me see if I can grab it. Um, you can sign up for our, our new website um, and get notified when it actually does launch, which we hope will be in the near future. So thank you again for having us. Um, not sure if we have time for Q&A right now. I will turn it back over to our gracious host. 
Thank you so much, Matthew and Rachel. No one can say now that they don't know how to access USAID information. This is just fantastic. Um, and, and just to, to remind, you, remind you all, there's, um, there will be a recording of this uh, session available. So you can go back to the chat and, and go to the, uh, the terrific resources um, that Rachel and Matthew posted. So thank you. Now we'll, um, I'll let Albina introduce Rebecca from IRX. Yes, thank you so much, Matthew and Rachel. And I put in a um, chat link to our Youth Power group where we will put uh, all questions that people ask it uh, about uh, USAD and any programming. So hope Rachel and Matt can answer there as well after the event, because we have a couple of questions for you. Uh, and now we need to move to the next speaker, uh, Rebecca Ward from IREX. And thanks so much, Rebecca, for coming today. And Rebecca will tell us about what does IREX do, uh, what a, how to access grants for youth programming, and such examples like youth accelerators, youth councils, small grant opportunities. So please, let's welcome Rebecca. Thank you. Can you guys see my slides now? Yes. Excellent. Yeah. So um, thank you very much for having us. I am Rebecca Ward. I'm a senior technical advisor in the education practice at IREX. Um, I'm also going to be joined by Zyra Linus, who's an officer on our Youth Excel program. So we'll give you a, a brief introduction to, to who IREX is and the work that we do in education and youth um, before sharing some insights about how we engage with organizations and, and individuals. Um, so IREX is a, a global development and education nonprofit, uh, and we strive to build more just prosperous and inclusive societies. And to do that, our strategy is to engage and empower youth, uh, to cultivate leaders at all levels of society, to extend access to quality education and information, and to strengthen education, civic and governing institutions. Um, so now I think it's important to distinguish ourselves from an organization like USAID. So IREX is not a funding body, um, we're not a donor, and we don't have access to our own unrestricted funds or unrestricted sources of revenue. Um, instead, we implement programs that are funded by other donors who have money to invest. Um, and most often we access this through competitions. And so like many of you, um, we're constantly scanning the horizon to look for new funding opportunities that will enable us to implement our strategy. Um, now, that's not to say that we don't have some funding available, because many of the programmes that we do deliver um, subsequently have small grant funds that we manage. Uh, so there are some opportunities to get smaller amounts of funding uh, from organisations like IREX. But often these are within the confines of specific programmes. Um, and so they have a number of kind of uh, restrictions around them in terms of geography and objectives and, and what they're seeking to achieve. So as, as Matt said, from the USA perspective, we, we also often have our hands a bit tied in that we don't have funding to support any interesting idea that comes our way. It's often very closely tied to, to a specific project. Um, but we do work with partners around the world, um, and I would say increasingly so. Um, so increasingly our projects are delivered by consortia and typically for any of our large programs we would be working with multiple local nonprofits in our target country. Um, we strongly believe that that leads to better outcomes and actually this is something that donors are, are actively promoting too and so you know returning to USAID as an example some of their missions are now stipulating proportions of budgets which need to be allocated to local partners and so I think the, the opportunities to engage with, with organizations like IREX are, are only going to to increase. So to give you a, a snapshot of our work in education, um, and we can follow up in, in Q&A if needed, 
we tend to work um, occasionally with students directly, but more often through educators and administrators who work in the education system. Uh, we work from basic education through to higher education. Um, and usually our programs are kind of targeted at uh, seeking to improve the relevance and quality of curriculum, improve the quality of teaching and learning, um, and ultimately to improve economic opportunity. So several of our programs are focused on university strengthening. Uh, we work with many universities in Iraq, and we also have a current program in Jordan supporting universities. And um, we also have a range of professional exchange programs with both university administrators and with teachers, um, which give them the opportunity to spend time at organizations in the US building, building their own capacity. And then we've got some basic education programs. One example is introducing learning through play and technology uh, in certain counties in Kenya. So that's just a snapshot. If you follow the link, link at the top of the slide, um, that will take you to more information about IREX's education programs. And every project has its own web page, which gives you more information uh, about who's involved, the staff you can contact for more information. And often there'll be information there about specific opportunities to engage. Um, in youth, um, we have programs that are designed to support youth directly and also those that seek to build the capacity of youth led and youth serving organizations. And here we're really focused on, on improving and increasing youth abilities and then providing opportunities for them to apply those abilities and build them over time, as well as supporting youth serving and youth led organizations to be more youth responsive and, and effective institutions. So again, I've just provided a snapshot of our programming here. And um, again, we have a range of exchange programs that provide opportunities for young people to travel to the US and, and build their networks. Uh, the largest of those is the Mandela Washington Fellowship for Young African Leaders. I think we've supported over 4,000 uh, young African leaders from every country in Africa. And um, the Community Engagement Exchange supports leaders between the age of 21 and 28 from over 100 countries again, to spend time in the USA, uh, US building the capacity of, of their, their own capacity and the capacity of their organizations. And, and then we also have some in-country programs and global programs too. So Zyra is going to talk a bit more about Youth Excel, um, which is currently a global program to empower youth organizations to use implementation research. Um, and we've got a range of programming focused on, on girls um, in particular and developing their economic technology and leadership skills in a range of countries. So. Again, that's just a snapshot. Follow the links at the top of the page. I'll put them in the chat as well for, for more specific information about how you can find more, more information on those. So how, how can you engage? Um, I was trying to think about the, the best way to frame this. And, and in my mind, it, it makes sense to think about two different phases. So the first phase is pre-award. And this is where we as an organization um, are developing proposals for new projects. So we may have seen something on grantscot.gov um, that we want to go for because we think we're well positioned for it. And we'll start doing lots of preparatory work to get ready for that proposal in the hope that we can win the competition to implement that program. So that's the first phase. And then the second phase is post-award. And that's when we as an organization has been chosen to implement a particular project. And I think there's different ways for individuals and organizations to engage at each stage of, uh, of that cycle. At the pre-award stage, one of the first things that we will do when we see an opportunity that we think we're suited for is to talk to local partners. And we will speak to many, many, many organizations as part of that process. 
ultimately with the view of identifying a consortia of organizations to be the implementation team. And so that, that's a great opportunity for, for local organizations to engage with a, a, a company or an organization like IREX. Um, and we, we can't talk to you unless we know about you. So a large part of my role as a senior technical advisor is to have conversations with prospective partners. And, and my door is open for that. I enjoy those conversations. I invite you to, to get in touch. And um, those conversations are always most productive if you've kind of done your homework in advance and all of the things that, um, that Matt was talking about from USAID have taken place. So you've maybe looked at the forecast and you're aware of specific op um, opportunities that you think you might be well suited for. You're aware of the types of approaches and strategies that USAID employs, and you're able to come to us with a super strong pitch and set of capacities that say, we think we're the right partner to bring you local reach, local trust, local networks, and all of these things that will make the program work more effectively. And I would expect to be speaking to kind of more, more than 20 organizations at, at that part of the process. So, so that's one way to engage. The, the other way to engage as individuals is that often as part of our kind of proposal preparation process, um, we'll hold a number of design sessions or knowledge sharing events um, in the country that the project is located. And they'll usually be advertised on social media or through local networks. Um, and we invite people with an interest in the topic area to come along. Usually there's some kind of panel discussion or workshop, and that's a really good way for individuals who are interested in, in a project to learn more about what's coming and even to have inputs into the design process. Um, and then in the post-award phase, you know, the, these are, again, very much kind of shaped by the project and, and what the project is seeking to achieve and what it will allow you to do. But there's a range of opportunities there as well. So, you know, you may become an implementing partner and have a subcontract or a sub award from uh, from IREX. Often we're looking for host institutions. This is more in the US, but looking for institutions to host our exchange fellows. And that can be a really kind of fruitful and invigorating experience for a US university or a US civil society organization. And we do have programs with subgrant pools, small grant pools that we manage. And I'll show you in a moment how you can find out about um, open, open opportunities. Um, and then we'll, we'll be working with our local partners to identify, you know, who will be recipients of technical assistance. So even if there's not funding available, there might be the opportunity to work with a project um, to, to receive technical assistance and, and to work with us in that way. And then as individuals, I've pointed to some of our fellowships and exchange programs. Um, many of our youth programs will have youth councils um, that we seek to put together right at the beginning of the program to help us detail out the design and then provide kind of inputs and oversight all the way through. Oftentimes, they'll be kind of uh, developed and populated through our local networks and our local partners. So we would probably put a call out for example, through a university we were working with and through their social media, as well as putting it on our own social media platforms. So it's really a good idea to keep an eye on websites uh, of organizations that you're interested in working with and their social media as well. Um, and then we often work with local consultants as well. So I saw, you know, there was a question in the Padlet about working for an organization like IREX. And um, all of our full time jobs are posted on the website, but there's routinely consultancy opportunities there as well. Um, and we see being locally based in a country where we're working as being a huge benefit. So, you know, don't rule out. Um, you know, your own ability to go for some of those consultancy positions. Um, 
If you want to find out more, uh, more about specific opportunities that are open, because I do appreciate I'm being quite, quite vague because the opportunities are so many and varied, um, you can follow the links to, to our website. So the first link um, takes you to a web page where you can search for both individual and organizational opportunities by country. And the second link takes you to a page that provides you with contact details for folk in all of IREX's different practices, including education and youth, and also our different country offices. Um, and so again, I would just reiterate that we do want to talk to, to local organizations and local networks. So do and, and feel free to, to reach out. Um, and then maybe we're running out of time, but in Q&A, we can maybe talk a bit more about some of the kind of tips and tricks and advice that we would give to, to make yourself stand out um, when, when you are kind of pitching, pitching yourself as a partner. Um, but for now, I'll pass over to Zyra um, from our Youth Excel programme. And she's just going to wrap up with a kind of specific example of partnerships under the Youth Excel programme and what they found to be particularly important um, for local organizations when they want to make themselves stand out. So Zyra, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Rebecca. So as uh, Matthew was mentioning before, Youth Excel is part of these uh, new partnership initiative of, of USAID. So that makes it um, our work very interesting working with local organizations. I am going to talk to you about some things we have learned through two experiences of selection processes in Youth Excel, where youth led and youth serving organizations have participated. And I would like to share briefly with you um, what characteristics makes uh, local organizations attractive. So I am going to go through some criteria we use in this process and some tips on how to engage with organizations like IREX. Um, one first thing is um, about diversity and inclusion. So um, we're looking for an organization that is representative of diversity and that have uh, practice and, and that practice meaningful inclusion. Um, also, we find important to work with organizations that work with marginalized groups. Um, the second thing would be organizations that know the context, the local context, and, and that have community trust. Um, this is critical to work from the do no more harm approach, for example, and it ensures a safe process and a meaningful process for everyone involved in, in these projects. Um, a third thing would be um, the importance of local and regional networks, as, as Rebecca was mentioning and highlighting during, during, her, um, during her part. So we are looking for organizations that are part of networks that have experience in, experience in leveraging networks. And as you know, these are fundamental for sustainability, um, especially when funding ends um we we've we have we got networks and it can also help to scale up your program um finally it's great to see organizations that show interest in a learning culture so share with us uh, what have you learned from your previous experience what do you want to learn and how are you going to do that etc and i will uh quickly finish with two tips um the first is Think what makes you different from other organizations. Uh, focus on one thing that you did really good instead of trying to do too much, instead of trying to cover uh, too many things. And my last tip, and I think this is the more important, there and have fun. Uh, don't discourage if you feel uh, you don't have everything that is required, but you can show other strengths and your interest in capacity building. Don't be shy and give it a try. You don't know if you are the one we're looking for. And if you don't make it, you have gained a valuable experience. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Rebecca and Zyra. I really enjoyed and I think I loved your graph with showing how people could engage with IREX. 
I think I even tweeted it. So to, to increase our reach of useful information today. And from my experience, uh, which I loved with um, US state funded projects is their mission to help countries in their journey to self resilience. And especially as Zaira said, for local NGOs, um, all, all implementers, donors, they know that civil society sector may, may not know everything, yeah? But um, in this big grant uh, programming, there is a mission to help you guys to build your capacity to teach you, uh, not to teach you, but uh, co-design with you the projects because you know the context, you know the challenges and you are partners. So please don't be shy if you think I, I'm struggling with concept, I don't have technical, you know, jargons, I don't know, you, you uh, people can help you. So, uh, and in the chat, there, I, I also shared links that Rebecca mentioned uh, about IREX website. So please don't worry if you feel your uh, NGO doesn't have kind of requirements or, uh, you know, some people uh, have struggles with procurement uh, policies, everything can be learned and strengthened. So this is from my personal um, experience. Thank you so much. I really loved it. And as we said, uh, because of time sensitiveness, we will put all questions on our hit page, uh, which people asked about IREX. So if Rebecca and Zyra would just be so kind and register and answer them in an informal platform, I think that would be awesome for many people because we have you know, big, um, diverse members coming from different parts. And now we need to move to our uh, next speaker and Yolanda, thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Albina. So our last but least uh, presentation comes from Uzma Anzar, who's project director and technical advisor at FHI 360 with, with decades of experience on how to work with USAID and also how to work with FHI. Uzma. Okay, thank you so much, uh, uh, Yolanda and uh, Alina, and uh, hello to everyone who has joined us uh, from different parts of the world. I'm going to briefly uh, speak about uh, what FHI 360 does and how uh, youth organizations and uh, um, others who are working in international development can engage with FHI 360. So, Alvina, will you be able to play the presentation? Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, so FHI 360 is uh, an international nonprofit uh, working group, and we are working to improve the health and uh, educational well-being of uh, people in the United States and uh, all over the world. We have uh, 4,000 employees working in 60 different countries. And our programming, um, the, 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 this FHI 360, the 360 denotes uh, FHI's um, perspective in program design, which is uh, highly contextualized and engages a lot of partners on the ground. Um, uh, we uh, work with uh, governments, USCID foundations and other donors, including uh, the World Bank and uh, DFID. Uh, our local partners are um, civil society organizations consisting of uh, youth groups, organizations focused on gender uh, equality and equity, and uh, local uh, education and health providers. Um, here are some examples of FHI's uh, engagement with youth organizations and institutions of higher education. Um, uh, we have um, the Next Engineers Program, which was recently awarded to FHI 360 by uh, um, GE Foundation. Uh, is focused on grades uh, 8 to 12 uh, students and uh, it, it aims to expose them to the STEM and engineering careers and fields. And uh, this program uh, is, is, is uh, geared towards engaging them during summer immersive experiences and uh, uh, you know, to further excite students to explore and realize their um, engineering uh, potential. Uh, and it is a multi-country initiative. Um, the AHEAD program in Afghanistan um, is, a, is also a recently awarded program and it has a huge youth component. We are working with improving um, uh, higher education quality as well as uh, uh, providing uh, 
uh, skills to students to better prepare them for the job market. And now, of course, because of the situation in the country, things are uh, at a standstill, but we are hoping that uh, uh, engagement with uh, uh, the government, which is uh, globally recognized, will continue and the youth, which is so desperately needs the assistance of the world, is able to benefit from this program also. Uh, the advanced Guatemala, Honduras, Jamaica, and the Dominican Republic uh, programs were focused, uh, you know, are focused on uh, two, two to three year of uh, technical education, tertiary programs. And uh, these programs are providing a market relevant education to the youth. So uh, I'm not going to go into details of uh, every program. The uh, ERA program in Ukraine is also focused on job readiness for youth. Kosovo after school program for young students is, is being implemented with Kosovo Education Center, which is a local organization and is preparing students for jobs and university uh, preparedness uh, skills. Uh, the uh, uh, Millennium Challenge Corporation is one of the uh, very, uh, you know, long standing partner and funder of uh, FHI 360's program in Guatemala and El Salvador focusing on secondary education improvement um, so that these students qualify for more economically beneficial disciplines at uh, universities. And the uh, USA Morocco Career Center worked with uh, universities. They established uh, career centers at universities and linked them with the three vocational uh, training institutes as well as the uh, private uh, businesses uh, for better job prospects for students. Um, so how can youth organization and higher education institutions work with FHI 360 as our speakers have uh, uh, guided before that uh, first thing you can do is to visit FHI 3 web website and explore programs in your country or wherever the region that you're located in. Assess what you do is aligned with the program objectives of FHI 360 pro project that Matthew spoke about, you know, your readiness um, uh, I, I think that that would be a very good place to begin with and then to see what FHI is doing is aligned with what your capacity is. And then you please do reach out to the program leader, uh, chief of party, technical uh, leaders who are working uh, with FHI are always available to speak and uh, you can introduce yourself, prepare a presentation which shows how what you do will further the objectives of uh, FHI's uh, program or the, uh, the funders objectives in the country. And another way to work with FHI is to apply for internships and jobs. We have uh, internships in almost every country where FHI works. And then of course, as uh, Matthew and Rachel mentioned before, uh, is visit uh, the USAID uh, project forecast website and see if there are upcoming programs, immediately write to FHI 360 and see if uh, you will qualify as a local organization to partner with uh, FHI with uh, on proposal development and uh, initial data collection. And on initial and data collection, I must say that uh, uh, USCID and all other funders are focusing on evidence-based programming and results-oriented uh, programming. So, uh, monitoring it for monitoring and evaluation of HI360 is always looking for a highly qualified data collectors, local. So if you have expertise in this, you are a professor or a student who uh, is interested in, in research, please reach out to FHI360 programs and uh, the because there is a lot of uh, work in this area, especially. So in the end, uh, you know, join us, work with us, teach us, because you know the local context better than uh, uh, you know the, the people who come from uh, uh, the headquarters and perhaps you can learn from us also. So thank you. Thank you, Uzma. You gave a lot of, of great information as well. We don't have much time left, but there are a couple of questions I'd like to address. Um, to uh, Rebecca, I don't know if Rachel and Matt are still here, and, and Uzma, of course. Um, one is someone who says, you know, someone who's been um, 
um, mentoring uh, youth in, in his or her community, the counseling youth, uh, uh, some are referred to their parents, and this person would like to scale it up and maybe come up with a youth empowerment center in his or her community. And he or she's saying, yeah, how do, you know, how I, I'm looking for resources to, uh, to come up with this youth empowerment center. What should I do? How can I partner with you? So that's one question, and um, and the other one is um, is about grants. How difficult is it to get grants uh, from you guys? So uh, if uh, Uzma, Rebecca, or uh, Zaina can uh, answer or take a stab at these questions, that'd be great. I, I can. Sorry, go on. <laughs> We're so keen. <laughs> I just wanted to chip in and add, uh, merge one question to Yolanda's. Uh, maybe you could also um, include this in your answers. What are tips uh, with um, filling out grant applications or code design process? What are usually people have problems with your partners? So this is opportunity to help you get better quality uh, partnership applications, maybe. Thank you. So, I mean, I, I can start with the first question about, um, you know, kind of scaling up this idea of, of youth mentoring. Um, you know, we do have a lot of grant opportunities, but many of them are actually tied to some of our exchange programs. And so I, I don't know whether that's always clear to, to individuals at the outset that, that many of the big exchange programs that we do do, like the Mandela Washington Fellowship and the Community Engagement um, Initiative, subsequently have small grants available to participants in that program. So as, as well as being a great opportunity for, for building your personal capacity and your capacity to, to run and scale an organization around mentoring, either of those programs would also potentially unlock small pockets of funding to then, uh, to then apply and, and use for that type of activity. And um, so definitely, you know, my advice from IREX's perspective would be don't write off exchange programs because they can be a really good way of, first of all, unlocking small grant funding, but also building a relationship with us. Um, and actually, we go back to our alumni again and again and again, um, because they have built that long term relationship with IREX. So, so that would be my, my advice on that one. Uh, thank you so much, Rebecca. I totally agree. Um, uh, one other thing that uh, uh, works in, in, our, in uh, our favor and our local organization's favor is if we are implementing uh, a cooperative agreement, which is more flexible, and if the, you know things can be adapted be, uh, given the situation. So if you have um, a youth advisory program or youth mentorship program and you would like to be the partner, and if it is a good program and uh, uh, you approach uh, FHI 360 team, then definitely if it is a, as I mentioned, is if it's a cooperative agreement, there is always room for adding new partners, especially if, the, uh, if it is going to uh, further the objectives and increase the beneficiaries pool on the ground. So there is uh, always flexibility then. And maybe if I, I can just add really quickly, we were um, discussing with Rebecca when we were talking about this, also about our commitment as organizations to make these processes more youth, youth friendly and um, avoiding all this jargon, using um, simple language to explain what's going on, um, having some activities like webinars to answer your questions about how to uh, how to uh, do these kind of uh, proposals, give you some tips. And we have had, um, we have seen um, really good um, uh, outcomes from these activities we have been practicing in, in Youth Excel. That's terrific. Thank you so much, Rebecca and Zara and, and Uzma and, and, and Matt and, Rachel, um, th there's a lot of information, a lot of it. It's overwhelming, but uh, everyone's working hard to make it more accessible. 
So um, before we close, we'd like to say that um, we will try, we will gather the, uh, the um, information that we, uh, that we get and we will put it on our heat page after, yeah. the, after this. Uh, so please stay tuned and, and look for these answers. Keep asking questions. Um, you never know, yeah. we may be able to get you um, an answer. Uh, uh, in you. terms of the uh, the heated sets, a little bit of household um, information here. We um, we are not sure yet to what extent this community of practice is going to continue. This we reached the end of our fiscal year. We funded by USAID, so the fiscal year is the end of our activity, and we are waiting to hear whether we will continue or not. Uh, so stay tuned, um, we will find out in, in October and we'll be in touch. So please go into the HEAT uh, page and, and, uh, and find out. And if anyone has ideas on what they would like to present uh, later in, during the year, please let Albina and I know and we will, um, you know, we'll make sure it happens if, if the community of practice uh, continues, but please keep your eye on the Youth Power platform. It is our key communication platform. Register, add your profiles. Um, we got to stay in touch. Awesome. Thanks so much, everybody. Great. Wonderful. Thanks for coming. So thank you. Thank you all. A big claps, claps to all of you, and congratulations on just a wonderful experience. And we learned a lot, so which is okay. uh, what it's all about. Thank you. Have a good rest of the day, of the evening, um, and be in touch. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.